scripture reading today is Mark 5, 6 through 9a. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, in God's name don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is, it, what is your name? So be it. So bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your throne today. You are so worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. As we read in Isaiah when he went before the, had the vision went before you on the throne in Isaiah 6, Lord, he realized just how sinful that he was. But Lord, yet you love us and you want us to be your very own. You want to pour out your amazing love and your amazing grace upon us, and, but yet we are stiff-necked people. Lord, help us through the power of the Spirit to just realize a glimpse of how great this salvation is that you've given us through Jesus Christ and it may forever change us. May we realize that our name is your child, your beloved Christian, that uh, the old ways are, are passed away, that behold, all things are become new. And even though we wrestle with the, with the flesh and with sinful desires and stuff, Lord, we know that the Spirit can sanctify us into all truth and reveal Jesus to us. We long for the day that we do uh, see Jesus face to face and spend eternity with you. And Lord, help us to advance the kingdom in the time being, not to be concerned about the things of this world or fear of things of this world, but to love you, O oh Lord, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and to let that be seen in how we love one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitle this Rebellion or Lack of Faith, and that scripture might sound a little weird that we read, but I'll talk more about it in a minute. You should have read Isaiah chapter 1 through 22 and Mark 1 through 5. So we've read Genesis and we've read um, Romans and then we went into Isaiah. And that may seem a little strange too. Why didn't we read Exodus yet? But the author of the, the devotions that laid out the plan takes us to Isaiah next so that we can see the rebellion that we still saw in Genesis. And unfortunately, am I on? Um, we'll get back to that in Exodus and we'll see it all throughout the Old Testament. We'll see it in the New Testament. We'll see a rebellious people, but we'll also see a loving, faithful God that would love you so much that He would give His only Son to save your life. So if I ask you this question, and I got an opportunity to ask this to somebody this week. Uh, if I asked you if unbelief was a sin, what would you say? And the guy that I asked, he's like, well, yeah. <laughs> and then I asked him, well, what do you think about lack of faith? Is that a sin? He said, well, no. Oh, ooh, hmm. What about lack of faith? We see it all throughout the Bible. Yeah, you see rebellion, and you want to point your fingers at rebellious people and say, I'm not like that. Well, read and read and read. And Paul puts that people that are disrespectful to their parents, he puts right in there with these other sins. Lack of faith is saying that you don't trust God enough to do what he says he's going to do. I mean, that's what you saw in Genesis. You saw all the other brothers, uh, the tribe of Israel. You saw Jacob himself looking at the desires of the world, but also fearing that God couldn't give them the promises that he said. Even Abraham and Sarah said, well, I can't have a baby, so have it through Hagar. I mean, there's constantly seen that. But we didn't see that so much with Joseph. Praise the Lord. In all his circumstances, he said, I'm going to fear God and I'm going to serve God no matter what. There wasn't the doubts that we saw with him. And what an incredible walk of faith. And I read Hebrews 11 again and stuff, and I'm astonished how he, he's not really mentioned in that, that history of Israel and all that. But look at the faith that he had and what God did in those circumstances. And when you're looking at your own life and then reading the devotion this week, it talked about the many times in our life when we're struggling and everything and we struggle even more because we don't have faith that God is big enough to take care of the problems in our life or we're why me, Lord, or whatever that point is. 
So I'll ask again, is lack of faith the sin? That's something for you to answer and to answer how. Probably, like I said, you might stumble on that question at first. You may not even agree with me on saying that. But lack of faith keeps you from walking a life of faith. And you are born again to live a life anew where you did not have the power before to live for God. And now you do to be a light to this world just like Israel was called to be a light to the Lord. Are we being a light to the Lord? Are you being a light to the Lord? If you believe in your heart who Jesus is and all the promises that God has given you, then that is saving belief. But like Paul had to write to the churches, he said, why have you so quickly fallen from that first belief you had? Jesus had to write, why have you fallen out of love with me, that first love that you have? Where is that faith that was there when you were saved? Where is that faith in your walk today? It may be just as strong. I'm not saying that it isn't. But if it's not, why is it not? And there might be a time to turn to God and say, I'm sorry for my lack of faith. When Jesus came down off the mountain, there was a man that brought his son to the church, or we'll call him the church at that point, to the disciples, to, for his son to be healed, to have the demon cast out. But the, the people could not do that. The apostles could not do that. The church could do that, however you want to label that. And Jesus got angry with them because of their lack of faith. He has called you to be his hands and feet in this world, and you have to have the faith to do that so that you don't cower down and make excuses or whatever it is for not walking the way God has called you to walk. So we see in Isaiah, we see this constant rebellion and God bringing judgment on the nation of Israel. And he pronounces out prophetically what's going to happen in history, and God's going to use these other countries that we think are the powerhouses of the world and stuff. He's going to use them to bring about what he wants to do. But he's also going to judge them for their sins, just like he's going to judge Israel for her sins, the nation's sins. I'm going to be judged for my sins just as well as you're going to be judged for your sins. Oh, I need to think more about that love my, my enemy thing, don't I? Because maybe my enemy did this or that to me, but if I acted in an unrighteous manner towards them, then I am just as guilty of sin. <clears throat> Lack of faith could be the very sin that keeps me from walking by faith in this world and being like Jesus in this world. Joseph was such a testimony of faith because he walked what he believed in each and every circumstance. Now what we saw from that is we saw that, that these different people that grew in their faith and their walk of faith, but we saw again that God is 100% faithful in His covenant. But are His people... Am I faithful to Him? Isaiah tells of this, this continued, continued rebellion and God's coming judgment. Told that, he's told that there will be a remnant that do believe, but God is also he's giving people time to turn and repent, but judgment is coming. You can't change that. Which side are you going to be on? And Isaiah, I'm sure he felt like he was just spitting in the wind. And I can't even fathom going around in front of you naked telling you that God's judgment is coming. <laughs> Cannot even fathom that. I think I would lack some faith there. Okay? I did do that one time. <laughs> but God's calling here is calling to you to tell you to turn and repent. The sad thing is there's not that many ears that will hear and obey. I want to mention a little bit to you about covenants because we've cut, talked about some covenants to this point and you have to understand this. You need to understand altars and sacrifices to understand what your life is supposed to be because you're supposed to be a living sacrifice. If you look up covenants in the Bible, you'll get that there's different numbers because it depends on what you call a covenant, whether it's spoken out loud and whether it's conditional or unconditional. But a covenant, to remind you again, is stronger than a contract. It's an agreement that is not supposed to be broken. And if you go back and see the example, there is blood that has spilled here. It is a promise that two people are not supposed to break, two parties aren't supposed to break. And this is a covenant between God and His people. A conditional covenant says, if you do this, this will happen. An unconditional covenant says, God will never change that. It's unconditional. And when we started out with the story in, in Genesis, there was a conditional covenant 
that was implied there, although not said. If you don't eat from this tree, everything will be fine. You will live. If you do eat from this tree, death will come. And then right after that, we read again of an a, a unconditional covenant that's implied that there will be someone that comes that will take care of this problem. Jesus. We don't know it yet in the story or anything. And then we go to the point of Noah, and you might call that the no, Noahic covenant, or however you want to say it, where God says, I'll never destroy the world again by flood. And he gives us a sign of that in the rainbow. And then we have the stated covenant that Abraham would be the uh, father of countless generations, but you don't understand until you read the story further that not everyone who says they're Abraham is Abraham because they don't have his faith. His descendants may be numerous, but again you're seeing in Isaiah that those who truly have the faith of Abraham are a remnant. And it took Abraham a long time to grow that faith, and it wasn't his own that did it, it was God living through him. And there was a promise that a Savior would come. There was an outward sign called circumcision, and you saw how that the sons of Jacob used that to actually murder people, that covenant sign. Then there is a stated covenant, um, a conditional covenant, that if you obey God, you will live a blessed life. He gives blessings and cursings with Moses. There is a stated unconditional covenant with David that, there, that someone, uh, a descendant of David would sit on the throne forever. We're pointing to Jesus again. Then you have the time that Isaiah comes and prophesies. Kingdoms have been set up. There are good kings and bad kings. But we have a stiff-necked people who still will not follow God. They say that they will, but their lips profess it and their hearts are far from it. There's where we are in Isaiah. You know enough of the story because you're here today that there's an unconditional covenant, a new covenant, a New Testament written in the blood of Jesus that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But you also read in Scripture that if you do believe that you will have works, not that works justify or you save you, you're saved totally by your belief. But James says that faith without works is dead. Meaning you still live in your sinful state, you will die, and you will face God's wrath. Isaiah wrote some 700, 750 years before Jesus, and he wrote of continuing rebellion leading to God's wrath. So turn and repent before it's too late. Did Israel return and repent? Some is everyone that professes to be a Christian today, are they really like Christ? Some. It's not our point to judge or anything, but it is our point to be a light. It is our responsibility to be accountable to our God and to live like Jesus in this world. If you notice, all of those covenants point to a redemptive story. And then Jesus said, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. You stay behind and you continue what I have started. And I'm going to say that again. You keep doing what I started. You, I called you, set you apart, a royal priesthood, my disciples, to continue this message to the world. So am I continuing this story to the world that people see God's love through me? Does my light shine because my heart is filled with Jesus, the light of Jesus, and He is stamping out all of the darkness so that I can be a child of light? I'm going to give you some definitions also. And I've given to you these before. You may know them. Pistis and pisteo. Those are two Greek words that talk about believing or faith. Pisteo is a verb. It's what you believe to be true. That God is able. It is saving belief. You are entrusted with it. You are committed to it. It's used 248 times in the New Testament in that form, and 239 of them are the word believe in the King James Version. A little different in the other versions. Pistis is a noun. It's conviction about what you do believe. So you see a little difference here. It's about your relationship with God, His relationship with you. It's about trust and faithfulness. It's about proof in the pudding, so to speak, as I said a, little, a few weeks ago. 
It's used 244 times and 239 times, exactly the same number in King James. It's, you, it's translated as the word faith. It's what you say that you believe that is proof because of the way that you live. I believe, therefore I walk by faith. So where does lack of faith come in? Oh, Lord, please give me faith. Increase my faith so that I do not doubt and so that I do not hinder the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. Because I pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, but yet I fight against it. Thy will be done, but I want my own will. And I could continue on. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, you remember him. If you translate his name correctly, not, well, I don't want to use correctly because then you'll say it's translated incorrectly. If you want to translate his name a little differently, it would be Jacob. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, boy, that puts some new implications on things, doesn't it? How we struggle with our faith to become Israel, to be the faith of Abraham, to be put our faith firmly in Christ that we could take our son up to an altar and sacrifice him because we have a strong enough faith, but we don't have to take our son up and sacrifice him because God already sacrificed his son, which is the perfect sacrifice, which will take away all of our sins and clothe us with robes of righteousness. Jacob, a deceiver who has to be, learn to, instead of wrestling with God, to get his way, to understand that no matter how much you wrestle with God, God is sovereign and going to have his way. So I'm thinking back to Isaiah and what Isaiah is saying. Oh, and in the time of Isaiah and in the time of the church, famines hit, don't they? Well, we're back to the time in Egypt again where I need to have faith that God is going to give me daily bread, part of that prayer again. But I would rather have that storehouse because I feel more confident and put my faith in it. But that storehouse might have been simply given to me so that I could be rich to others. Now we're to that parable of the rich fool. All of these things to think about, about where my faith stands and how much I have a lack of faith versus a faith that can move mountains. In James chapter 1, James writes this letter, and he probably is the first one writing to the church, the New Testament church, God's people, this new nation of Israel, if you want to term it that way, that's been grafted in because of the stick nap rebellion and sin of Israel themselves. Grafted into God's family so that we can live as God's children, and the veil has been torn, we have direct access to to God the Father, through Jesus Christ the Son, by His Holy Spirit living into me to cry out, Abba, Daddy, my Father. Wow. So how am I using this to be more like Christ in this world? Hebrews says the Old Testament saints and prophets long for the time that was coming. Jesus came and we are living in the power of the Holy Spirit now if we're letting Him live through us. James chapter 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes, to Israel, the ones scattered among the nations, greetings. And they're scattered among the nations this time because of suffering, but to spread the gospel message. They're not scattered across the nations because God's rebellion is coming and He sent in conquering kingdoms. But there's still this picture of kings and kingdoms in this world, and we're to live for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, because we are His children. Scripture says we're already seated in the heavenly realms. Consider it pure joy then, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith, pistis, produces perseverance. Hebrews 12, 1 talks about perseverance. It says, seeing all of the witnesses of the faith that we saw in chapter 11, let us run this race set out before us with perseverance. Back to James chapter 1, verse 4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Or your version may say perfect. Not lacking anything. That we're working to that point where faith overwhelms us so much that we can have that faith of Abraham where nothing will stand between us and God. We trust Him. Verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault. Ask Him to give you more faith, and it will be given to you. 
Verse 6, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Pistis, faith. You must have faith that He is going to answer your questions, your concerns, your prayer requests, whatever it may be. But you've got to ask in faith that not wavering. Or, it says, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. But yet he's still faithful to his covenant promises. He still loves you and pours out his grace on you. There's still sunshine and rain for the wicked and the righteous. Verse 8, such a person that lacks faith, that wavers in his faith, is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Because the guiding point, the compass that we have that saved us, faith, is not guiding us anymore as we walk through this world. Because the other concerns, the doubts, the fears, the desires we have, whatever they are that keep us from walking a life of faith. Skipping down to verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. You have no doubt of it. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone, everyone, anyone. Excuse me. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and are enticed upon them. Verse 15, Then after desire, or yours might say lust, after it has conceived, after it has given birth, it then gives birth to sin. So that lack of faith, if you say lack of faith isn't a sin, I say it is. You don't have to agree, but it does lead to sin. Scripture tells you that clearly right here. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, when it grows up, because it's going to continue after conception to grow and grow and grow, or your faith is going to, one or the other, sin leads to death. So verse 16, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth. He chose to give Alan birth. You can put your name in there. Through the word of truth that we might be what? The kind of first fruits of all that He has created. And Jesus was the first and we're to follow. We're to be like Jesus in this world. Verse 19, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, wrapping together what James has said so far, this first letter to the church because of the path that they are potentially going down, whatever the reasons are that he wrote it, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted inside of you, that word that will save you. Verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So I ask the question again, is lack of faith a sin? It is not believing, not trusting that God can fulfill His covenant promises to you. Jesus died for your sins and has empowered you to live like Him in this world until He returns to you. And it is so critical because you are an ambassador, you're an alien, you're a foreigner, you're a sojourner in this world. You're just passing through. This is not your home. You have a mission as an ambassador. It's to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ and to live like Jesus in this world so that people will believe you instead of say that you're a hypocrite and full of hypocrisy. So how are you living your life? Back to Isaiah. Because of their continued sin and rebellion against God, instead of God using them to bring them to them, He uses the kingdoms of the world to literally strip away everything that He had given them. But yet He's still with them in captivity and everything else. God is so awesome. And continuing as we read through, through Isaiah, we see the promise of Jesus Christ. We see that those faithful will be saved. People from all over the world will come to the new Jerusalem. They will come because of faith in Jesus Christ and what He has done, this new covenant. And there is time to repent. Today is the day of your salvation if you are still hearing God call to you. So repent and turn. It makes no sense to not put your faith and trust in God alone. 
to put your faith in anything else. Because if I put my faith in money, if I put my, my faith in my family, if I put faith in, my, in uh, my wisdom, what happens when those things are stripped away from me? Solomon, who had everything, wrote many, many proverbs. And one of the things that always pops in my head that he wrote, probably the most of any of them, is that life is a vapor and all these things we chase after in this world are meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. In chapter 6 in Isaiah, he's taken before the throne room and he realizes what a sinful man he is. Is that what brought you to saving grace to Jesus Christ? Did you realize the debt of your sin, the depravity of your sin? The debt that there's no way you could pay, but God loved you enough that He sent His Son to pay that. Is that what you believed and accepted? Then why would you not walk continuing that belief, growing that belief, reading God's Word, living by faith, asking Him to increase your faith as you read your Word, and not stumble over things like love your enemy, not stumble over things like how much to give, not stumble over things about your will rather than His will. Whatever those things are, I'm not pointing the things out, I'm just giving examples. For Israel, even though there seemed to be no hope, there's still hope in all of that time. And we see God's plan, His redemptive plan through history, that it points to Jesus Christ. No matter how unfaithful we are, God is still faithful to His promises. There is hope. And all of our hope is grounded in Jesus Christ. So why, won't we, why would we not want to live by faith for Him? <clears throat> Isaiah penned these words in chapter 6. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make the heart. God Himself drawing away from them and hardening their hearts because they would not listen to Him. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What a terrible thing to think of that God would actually quit calling you and harden you instead because you can't come to Him unless He calls you first. So are you answering Him when He calls you? Or are you making excuses because you lack faith? Or because you have another idol or a love over Him? You know, those words were quoted by Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John talks about them too, but he does it in his own. In chapter 12, right before Jesus goes to his private ministry before he says he's going to lay down his life. He says that a, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. And he says that this, or John writes the same words of Isaiah, that it is a terrible thing to consider and the, the, the fulfillment of this prophecy that they're listening then, they've already welcomed in his, him into Jerusalem as their king, Hosanna, save us, and that they really didn't hear they really didn't understand because they didn't have the words in their heart. They wanted a Jesus who would give them things, but they didn't want to follow a Savior, especially to a cross. Oh yeah, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Those are Jesus' words. In chapter 7 of Isaiah, and we read through chapter 22, but I'm not going to go through each chapter in chapter 7, you read this in verse 14. Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call Him Emmanuel. Wow. No matter how wicked we are, no matter how disobedient we are, no matter how stiff-necked we are, no matter how many other gods we have, no matter how little faith we have, God is still faithful. 
and He sends His one and only Son to dwell with us. And Jesus said, I will never forsake you or orphan you. I will tell the Father to send the Holy Spirit. He is with you, living inside of you today, guiding you into all truth if you truly believe and will let Him guide you. All throughout the rest of the chapters in 8 through 22, we see that God is in control. He uses the kingdoms and kings of this world for His bidding. In Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet. That's how Mark starts out. As it's written in Isaiah, here is the fulfillment of this. This is Jesus Christ dwelling among us, Emmanuel, God with us. All of these prophecies fulfilled, including the ones about the people who will be forever hearing and not perceiving what it says, forever seeing but yet still being blind. Where do you stand in that good news today? Jesus, verse 14, went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And He said, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this good news. And if you truly believe, that's why I started out with James first, you will live a life that proves it. Verse 16, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said, Listen to the irony in this. You're fishing for, for fish. I'll give you your daily food and everything. Remember, I'll multiply fishes and bread. You, verse 17, come follow me. And I will send you out to be fishers of men, to fish for people. What did they do? Their response, at once they left their nets and followed him. They didn't sit down and discuss first about how this was going to happen or anything else. They had saving faith that said, let's leave everything behind and follow Jesus. Verse 19, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, that could be Jacob again, the son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father even in the boat and the hired men and followed after Jesus. No hesitation, saving belief. This is the Messiah, the one that Isaiah the prophet wrote about. He's here in the flesh now. We have to follow him. And as Peter says later as you read through the Gospels, there is no way we can deny you, Lord, John chapter 6, when the rest of the people, even the disciples, left Jesus. There's no way we can leave you because you have the words of life. Life here on this earth and eternal life. James, I told you, was mentioned here, which could be Jacob again, the heel catcher, the deceiver, the one who lacked the faith, but we saw it grow to be, realize the promise God made to him that he would be Israel. God's chosen people, His family would be. And we saw how many of His brothers went the opposite direction, the ways of the world. But we saw Joseph's faith. Man, I'd go back and read Joseph's faith and what he did in each crisis again. Because he showed his respect, his love, his faith in God through each of those situations. The word also means supplanter. If you don't know what that means, Jacob does. Or James. And a supplanter is one who goes or comes alongside of. See, the problem with Jacob way back there where he was wrestling with God is he said, mm, God, you come beside me and bless me. God says, you come beside me and I'm going to bless you and bless the world regardless because it's who I am. Do you have enough faith to come alongside of me and deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me? So now we see men really coming alongside of Jesus and not worrying about the things of the world. They are a new creation in Christ, and they don't even know the mighty miracles Jesus knows yet. They all, all they know is that He is the one that Isaiah prophesied about. He is our hope. He is our saving grace. Because God is faithful. So who is this Jesus to you? Do you believe? Then will you follow Him in a life of faith, living as His child in this world? In Mark chapter 4, we get to that seed that is planted. And again, the best way I can describe this story, this story period, this parable, which is probably the most quoted parable in the New Testament, is that the farmer went out and planted his seed. And the seed is the Word of God. It's the kingdom of God coming to earth. And the farmer planted his seed, but he spread it everywhere. Some on hard ground, on the path. Some on rocky soil. Some where thorns were. He graciously spread his seed everywhere. But only some grew up and produced childlike faith. And if Kira hears me, she's going to come up and read some in a minute. Childlike faith that simply says a farmer planted his seed for this purpose, to grow a crop so he can harvest it. 
Are you going to be a part of that? Are you a part of that? None of the other seed matters. It doesn't matter what happened there. It doesn't matter why he was so gracious with the seed. I mean, it does. Don't get me wrong. But the thing is, is a farmer, logically, from a child's perspective, planted seed so it would grow and there would be a crop. But he continues on and he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like in verse 26. A man had scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. You don't do anything except be a part of it. Though he does not know how. All by itself the soul produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said... What, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable should we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds on earth. When they are planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. We don't know how the seed does it again. The power's in the seed. Uh, we're part of it. But it grows and becomes the largest, this tiny seed, with such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. Birds... Physical birds of the physical mustard seed, but he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Birds can come, and what grows out of this seed because of the way we live, to find food, shelter, rest, trust, if you'll do it. If you'll live like Christ, you'll be His hands and feet in this world. You'll draw people into the kingdom. If not, you're a hypocrite. Whoa, whoa, whoa. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body or what you'll wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. <laughs> we just talked about them. They don't sow or reap. They have no storerooms or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Where is your faith? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow also. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Is that, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your hearts on what you will eat or drink or worry about it, for the pagan world ru runs after such things, and your Father knows that you need Him. But instead, seek His kingdom first, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. See how this ties together with Israel. See this redemptive story of God's covenants and His grace. See a people who were stiff-necked and rebellious but you don't have to be. All you have to turn is say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come and live in my heart. Live through me. Empower me. Help me not to fear. Increase my faith so that I can be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Oh, Jesus went on to say, sell your possessions and give to the poor. So you wouldn't even have that burden. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail. We're not where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return. You want to read? You do or don't? You don't want to read your book? I'll read with you, or I'll sit beside of you. You want to read it? Come on, read it to me. Because you said you wanted to. Do you not want to? You want me to read it? Don't you want to read it to everybody? Okay, do you want me to read it to everybody? You came and shared it with me yesterday. You want Cameron to read it with you? I'll hold it. You read. I've got to get down on the ground first. <laughs> How big is what? Start over. Go Just ahead. how big is God's love? God's love is bigger than the biggest elephant. Brighter than the brightest 
or shiny is sun. Deeper than the deepest ocean. Longer than a lizard's tongue. Stronger than a mighty lion. More joyful than a baby, baby's laughing. Sweeter than all of the candy. Got one more. Taller than a giant giraffe. But the best thing about God's love is there is so much to share. Gotcha. So when I was finishing my sermon, she came up and said, let me tell you this, and read that to me. I told you earlier you might find the scripture that I read that I had Merle read is strange. When you read that story, sometimes you look at all these other things and you don't look at yourself where you stand in the picture. You know the story from Mark chapter 5. Hopefully you read there and that's where you should have read to. There's this man, men, if you read, there's two men, maybe more than two. Because when you read scripture, realize that. We know there's one man, but another gospel says there's two men, so there could have been ten men. But we know there's one for sure. Oh, we know there's two for sure. Same way when you go to the tomb, so don't look for discrepancies there. But Mark talks about this one man, which makes me think about this one man. And Jesus has not come to him. But when he sees Jesus, he runs to him and he worships him. He's possessed by a legion of demons, a fighting force too numerable to count. Surely that is too great of odds for me to overcome. And it is for me, but not for Jesus. So when he sees Jesus, oh, let me just read it, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, he, the man, not the demons, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God, God's name, don't torture me. Was this the legion of demons talking, or was this the man talking, or both? The man comes running at Jesus' feet and falls in front of him. That's worship. The man in his, desire, in his desperate situation, all else fell, I can't take it anymore, God, comes running and falls at Jesus' feet with something that's way too big a legion of demons. And I can't even speak because the legion of demons shouts out instead. He knows how sovereign God's, God is and he knows Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, don't torture me now because my time hasn't come. I know all of God's plans. I know what's going to happen to me, but I'm going to wreak havoc in the time being. I take over this man's voice where he can't even speak. Verse 8, For Jesus had said to him, already, that's in the past tense, I don't know if Jesus said it before he got to that side of the lake. I don't know if he said it when he saw the man. But Jesus already said to the demons, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked, what is your name? Well, the conversation goes on and he says, legion of demons. But what is my name? When I come running to Jesus and saving faith and say, Jesus, you are enough. I know who you are. What happens after that in my walk of faith? Do I forget my name as a child of God is blessed? And then do I go back and fall in those same patterns? The world didn't want him at that time. He took away their livelihood. The pigs ran into the, into the sea and drowned. So they wanted Jesus to get out of there. And that man said, I want to come with you too. I want to go home. I'm ready for heaven now. But Jesus said, nope, your place is to stay here and be the hands and feet to this nation, to these people, the ones who don't want me who will mock you, who will persecute you, who may crucify you. But I'm leaving you behind to be my hands and feet. What is your name? Is it Christian? Or is it somebody who lacks faith and will sit beside and let the world go on and won't proclaim the message of God and won't live like a, the, a child that belongs to the kingdom of God because you have other idols or you fear what will happen to you? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do I believe this and will I walk this? Lord, please increase my faith because I struggle with it every day because I fight a spiritual battle. Let me put on God's armor. Let me let you quench all the fiery darts of the devil because of of your saving grace. Help us to be a people of increased faith. Thank you for reading that to me, sweetheart, and to the people. Father in heaven, I pray that I know that you're faithful. I know that you always will be. I pray that I don't doubt that. That I stand firm in faith, that you increase my faith, that your spirit sanctifies me, that I let him renew my mind by condemning the world and being a preacher of righteousness. That I don't stand in the way because of my lack of faith. Search my heart, O oh Lord. If there are any impurities for me, in me, show them to me and let me lay them before the throne of Jesus so that I don't hinder in this. Father, be with your people. Fill them with your word. Help them to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world, no matter what circumstances they're in. We pray for unity of the Spirit, direction of the Spirit, and we long for the day that we do meet Jesus face to face. We pray for our family and for our children, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all praise and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.